What's going on everybody? So in this video, I'm gonna show you my five step cold calling methodology you can use to craft the perfect cold calling script. And you wanna make sure you watch this video all the way through because if you're someone who's ever struggled with cold calling, chances are you probably didn't have the right methodology to increase your chance of success. So in this methodology that you are about to learn in this video, there's gonna be five simple steps you can follow step by step so that you can start getting more results now. What's going on everybody? My name is Patrick Dang. Before we get started, make sure to give this video a like, subscribe, and turn on notifications if you wanna see more sales videos like this and let's go ahead and dive into the five-step cold calling methodology now before we even get into cold calling you're gonna want to do your research and this is step number one research is incredibly important because if you're not calling the right person and they actually shouldn't even be a fit for your product and service, well, no matter how many times you cold call them, it's not going to work. So you can't just, you know, pick up the phone book and start dialing random numbers. You have to figure out ahead of time who's actually likely to be positively receptive to your cold call. So ask yourself, are the decision makers in the industry you are trying to cold call into the type of people that like cold calls and they actually pick up the phone or are they people that don't even you know, pick up cold calls at all? And also is the company that you're trying to call, how likely are they to buy your product and service? Do you know their buying window? Do they already have a budget set for buying a product or service like yours, right? Are they buying something that's seasonal or can they buy at any time or how likely are they to be unhappy with their current vendor and they're willing to switch to another vendor and that could be you, right? So these are the questions you have to ask yourself and you have to really think, you know, are the companies that you're calling even qualified to buy your product and service, right? And of course, you know, you're not a mind reader. You can only do so much research online, but you have to have some kind of filter, right? Whether it's, you know, revenue, employee size, maybe you already know what kind of software they're using, and maybe you're selling something that complements those softwares, like a consulting service or some kind of add-on, right? So all these questions, you have to pre-qualify before you call, and you would only wanna call the people that actually have a chance of buying your product and service. Now, when it comes to the priority of people, you should be calling, right? Here is generally what I would recommend. In the beginning, if you're cold calling and you're working at a company, obviously the easiest people to call are current customers, right? Current customers that you can sell more to, very easy because you already have a relationship. Now you can also call people who are previous customers and maybe they canceled at some point and maybe you can you know, get them to sign back up again, right? It's a lot more easier to call people you did business with. The next priority goes to inbound leads, meaning you know companies that or prospects that you know came from inbound, meaning maybe they saw a blog post, saw a video, gave up their email and phone number, and you can call them because their number went into the CRM, or even referrals, right? Someone recommended another person, and then you can call that person. So obviously, this is not necessarily cold calling, right? It's more warm, they kind of know who you are. But if you have those opportunities at the place you're working, go for the warm ones first, because those are much more likely to succeed. Now, after all the warm priorities, then you have to get into the more cold territory where people don't really know who you are and they haven't signed up for anything. So when it comes to cold calling, right? First, if let's say the company you're working at has some kind of CRM database and maybe they're constantly updating with, you know, things like the buying window of a customer or their budget or what software they're using, right? So a lot of companies, they might pay for this information, right? They might pay for information that, you know, may have signals of when someone is likely to buy. So if your CRM says, you know, these type of companies always buy in January, February, and March, and you know, quarter one, then let's call all these companies, you know, during quarter four of the, you know, the year before or in quarter one to make sure that they know who we are before they make a purchasing decision, right? So if you can buy this information or ask your company to buy, it, or maybe they already have it, obviously use that because there's pre-qualification there. Now, if in the case you do not have that information, right, but those would be more prioritized, and you have to call straight up code and you're collecting information, then I would save that towards the low priority, right? So you do warmer calls first, then kind of warm based on qualification information that you buy, or you find online. And then from there you go from like really cold where they really don't know who you are and you don't know anything about them. And you call them, you ask these questions and you fill out the information in your CRM to see you know, what's their budget? What's their buying window? When are they available to actually make a purchasing decision? What's the timeline, right? So as you're cold calling, you have to understand that you know, not everyone's gonna be receptive to the cold call, but you have to work a territory. And that's typically how sales work. Like, you know, when I was at Oracle, I had the West Coast territory of, you know, selling to Nevada, Hawaii, and California. So, you know, it's like we work in the companies in our territory and they, you know, we keep hitting those companies to make sure they know who we are 
and that when they are ready to buy, they're gonna think about us. So when your territory, you have to think like, are you working the territory? Do people know who you are? And you know, if they're not ready to buy now, are you putting that, logging that in somewhere so that six months from now or when they're ready to buy, you can cold call them again and say like, hey, look, uh, you know, I talked to somebody six months ago and they said that you know you didn't have the budget then, but now they might have it now. And so I just wanted to see, you know, if that's some, if that was true and blah blah blah, right? So that's basically how it works. It's like you get some information, you put it into your CRM, and you you know identified the best times to recall that person. You cold call, call them over and over and over until they actually are ready to buy. So it's not like it's gonna be like, oh, someone you cold call someone, they're ready to buy right now. It's like you cold call, you collect information, maybe later they're ready to buy, put it in your CRM, make a reminder, and then call them again later, right? So research is very important to get all these things down because it's not about just dialing random numbers, hoping that you close a sale right there. You gotta work a territory. Now the next step of the process when it comes to cold calling is building rapport, right? You've done your research, you're calling the right person, they're likely to buy, you know their budget, you know their timeline, all these information. Then you go into building rapport. So when you cold call someone, the first step of the whole thing is building rapport, right? Before you even get to any selling or asking questions, you gotta get the other person to like you as a human being so that they are willing to listen and talk to you on the phone. Like what makes cold calling so difficult is because a salesperson will call someone out of the blue. They don't expect your call. So why should they be positively perceptive to someone who's trying to sell them something, right? Uh, they probably won't be. So that's why most people hate cold calling. But if you kind of switch your perspective around, instead of saying, I'm gonna sell this guy, I'm gonna say like, I'm going to build a relationship with them. Now you're building rapport because people like to buy from other people that they like. And they go, you gotta get people to like you, right? And the first step of building rapport is your tonality. So it's not about the words you say, it's how you say it, how you sound. Is your voice pleasant? Do you sound like them? You know, when they hear your voice, are they thinking, this guy gets me, this guy is just like me? Right? And these are the emotions and feeling that you want to create within the first five seconds and you wanna do it throughout the entire cold call. So remember, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. You don't need cheap tricks, you don't need like gimmicks, right? You just need to understand how your voice sounds, record yourself speaking, and see if that's something that you would personally even respond to if you got a cold call that sounded like that. You could change different parts of how you sound based on the volume, how loud or soft you're speaking, your inflection, how high or low you're speaking, and also the speed of how fast and slow you're speaking, right? You can also change the energy level, right? Are you, do you have high fast energy that is too much for people or is it too low? Or you know, how do you make it just right for that person? And a rule of thumb is that you wanna start off you know, positive and calm, like, hey, it's Patrick from Oracle, how you doing today? And from there, you wanna just mirror the other person, meaning whatever their energy level or how fast and slow they're speaking and things like that. Basically, you just wanna mimic it so that they feel like, oh, this person is just like me and people like to buy from people who are just like them, right? It's like that commonality. So you can do all this subconsciously by controlling your tonality and getting that locked in in the first five seconds of a conversation. So once you start building rapport, the next step is your agenda, right? So you build rapport with the opening line saying, hey, Sally, it's Patrick from Oracle. How you doing today? Sally says, oh, uh, I'm doing okay. What's up? Uh, Sally, I'm actually a little lost. Do you mind if I take a second to tell you why I'm calling? And Sally says, all right, sure. So you go into the agenda. Now the agenda is basically setting the right expectations for the call. It's basically showing why you're calling, what value you bring, why they should listen to your call by the end and what should happen at the end of the call or what can they expect, right? You're basically going through all of that really quickly in the agenda and then you wanna make sure they agree to your agenda before you move into the next step of the call, right? So after you build a rapport, do the first line, you ask permission to you know, tell your agenda, an example could be something like, I'm part of the partnerships team at Gusto, and the reason I'm calling is because I noticed a lot of small businesses in the construction space typically use outdated payroll software that's extremely slow and hard to use. And what I do is I actually help these type of companies modernize and keep all their HR systems up to date and, and comply with all the changing laws. And so I wanted to take five minutes to learn a little bit more about your business and how you're handling HR to see if there's an opportunity for us to work in any capacity. Now at the end of the call, if we find that, hey, maybe there is a fit to work together, great, we can move on to the next step. But if not, we find that it's not a good fit, totally fine. Is that okay with you? So Gusto is basically a payroll software for small businesses, helps you basically pay your employees, make sure that they're paying like Medicare, Social Security, and all those things, right? Now, if I identify that companies in a construction space, they do payroll manually, or maybe they're using old software from 10 years ago and they haven't updated it yet because maybe it's difficult for them to you know, upgrade their legacy software into the cloud, which a lot of people do have that problem. Well, maybe I can help them do that and I sell them my software. So 
in that example of the agenda, you know, it's not too long. Obviously I can shorten it if I wanted to. And it basically gets my point across. And I tell them the reason I'm calling, I'm from Gusto. I help people update their HR software. I tell them how long the cold call is gonna be. I said, it's gonna be five minutes. And I'm gonna tell them what happens at the end of the call, right? Either it's a fit to work together or it's not a fit. If it's a fit, great, we'll move it to the next step. If it's not a fit, then totally fine. And the call is over right there. So there's no real, you know, like commitment on their end. They just have to say yes, right? They're not buying anything. They're not getting pitched anything. I want to learn a little bit more about your business, how you're handling your HR to see if it makes sense for us to work together in any capacity, right? And at the end you say, is that okay with you or sound fair to you? And the other person is gonna say yes, because logically and emotionally, it makes sense. You know, it's like, it's a quick call. May, if they have that problem, they wanna hear what you have to say, because maybe you can solve it, right? And maybe they never thought about upgrading their HR software. So they're gonna say yes, and you're gonna have that sales conversation. Now, if they say no, you just ask them why. So if they say, oh, no, I'm not really interested, Patrick. You say, oh, that's really interesting. Um, you know, just curious to know, are you using, you know, an old legacy software, or is it you already updated, and that's why you don't wanna continue through the call? They might say something like, oh yeah, we actually just updated to this person, so, you know, we really love them, it's really great, and I don't think we're gonna switch anytime soon. Right? If that's the case, you know, it's actually a very difficult sale to do. And then, so if you wanted to like pry more deeper into that, you can ask questions like, oh, interesting, you know, how long you've been using them? And then they'll tell you and you say, oh, well, you know, if you were to give them a one out of 10 of how happy you are with their services, you know, what would that be? They might say like, oh, you know, a uh, seven. Say seven, I thought you said you were happy with them. Why is it a seven out of 10? And so you start getting into maybe some of the problems that their current vendor has. And if it's seven out of 10, maybe there's opportunity for you to replace their current vendor, right? But if there's not an opportunity and they're completely happy, then you gotta move on to the next person because it's very difficult to sell someone who just bought another competitor. Now, that's just an example, but many different scenarios can come up. So after you do the agenda, and let's say they just agree with it, they're like, oh yeah, let's do the meeting. From there, you go into the meat of the meeting. That is to uncover pains, right? So the majority of a sales call if you get to this point, is going to be about their pains, right? Because you want to ask the prospect all these different questions to understand like what exactly is their problem and how can you potentially solve their problem and you know how should you position your product and service as a solution to the problem so that you know it's very obvious for them that they should buy. So what I typically like to do is I like to reference some kind of data first and then I would you know provide an insight about that data and then I would ask a question. Okay, so some kind of research or data, you know, my, my insight, my opinion about that, and I will ask them a question um, to dive into their pains. And the reason I go through this order is because it makes your question sound a lot smarter. There's more context for someone to work with, and you, that question actually guides the rest of the conversation. So let me give you an example. Like I mentioned before, a lot of construction companies in your space are typically using legacy payroll software from 10 years ago. So, which is, you know, very hard to use and sometimes doesn't really work right. And it's very difficult, especially when the government updates the tax laws and you have to change everything. And it's very difficult, I understand that. So I was curious to know what you were using for your payroll and what your experience has been so far. So when you ask a question like this, if the person is using, let's say a legacy software and it's very painful for them, maybe they're the director of HR but you know, the, the CEO just never upgraded the software for some reason, they might say like, oh my God, Patrick, I totally have that problem. We've been using this outdated software for 10 years. I'm not even sure why we're using it. The product looks you know, outdated. It doesn't even work right. And every time the government update the tax laws, I have to go in and manually do it. We have to hire engineers to change the code to update the laws. And it takes us weeks to do that, right? They might say all these crazy things. If someone really has that problem, they're gonna tell you everything right there. If they kind of slightly have a problem, it gives them more context to start, right? So they might say like, yeah, Patrick, we've actually been using um, this old software for like 10 years and it works, but, and then they kind of go into a problem like, but we have to hire engineers to change the code every time the government updates the tax law, something like that. So from there, if you get any sort of pain, whether if it's a big pain, this is part super easy because they're telling you all their problems right off the bat. If it's a small pain, just like, oh, you know, we have to hire people here and there to get it done. You want to make that little tiny pain into a big problem, right? You want to make the person aware of how big that problem is so that they're more persuaded to buy a product and service. So you can say something like, oh, interesting. So let me get this right. When the government updates their tax law, you have to hire a freelance engineer to come into your software and go to your company on premise to change the code so that it's updated. 
you know, that sounds like a lot of work. You know, how long does it actually take to happen? And then they might say, oh, well, to do that actually takes us about three weeks. And I was like, oh, three weeks just to change a little bit of code? Yeah, 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 right? And then you would say, oh, well, you know, how much does that actually cost to hire someone like that? And they might say, well, actually, if we got to hire someone for three weeks as a freelancer, typically it's going to cost us about $10,000 just to do this. And you say $10,000 just to change a little code every time the, the government updates their tax law. And it's like, yeah, yeah. And that's, then I would say, well, how often do you have to do this? And they might say, uh, well, depends on the year and you know what the tax laws are, but typically we gotta do it at least four times a year, right? Basically once a quarter. And I'll be like, well, isn't that kind of interesting that that's $40,000 a year, right? Just to change some code. They're like, yeah, that's right, Pat, that's right. And so as you can see, I'm asking more and more questions to dive deeper to understand their situation. I'm not pitching my product and service yet, right? I sell, let's say I'm selling a payroll software. I'm not pitching it yet. I'm trying to understand what their pains are so I can pitch it later. So if I find out that, let's say they got legacy software, they um, have to hire a freelance programmer to come in and fix it every time. They have to you know, spend you know, tens of thousands of dollars every time they do this. Um, so it wastes a lot of time, wastes a lot of money, right? So now it's starting to become a bigger problem because for my software, maybe my software costs a thousand bucks a month, right? So over a year, maybe it's 12K. But if what they're doing is 40K and it's a lot of manual labor, well, it's a no brainer to just use my software because it's 25% of the price of what they're already paying and it's already way better as a solution. So now you're starting to see why, or now the prospect is starting to see like, hey, I have this really big problem that I thought it was okay and we're just getting by, but actually, based on what Patrick's saying, this shouldn't even be a problem. Why are we still doing it this way, right? And so that's how you wanna make the prospect feel during the cold call so that towards the end of the cold call, what you can say is, is something like, look, um, seems like you have a lot of challenges when it comes to your, you know, your payroll software. You want me to go ahead and share what I do and how I might be able to help you out in this situation? They're gonna say, sure, Patrick, tell us what you do. And then from at that point, once you collected all the pain, you shortly describe like how you solve their problem, right? So if I'm selling Gusto, the, the payroll software, I'll say, well, typically what we can do is um, we will help you automate all of this by doing X, Y, Z. So you just go into your pitch of what your product service does, who is it for, what value it brings, how much time and money they're gonna save and this and that, right? You don't want your pitch to be too long, just enough for them to be like, yep, that's exactly what I need. I have a problem, you can solve it. So once you go through your pitch, what typically is gonna happen next is they're not gonna buy it on the first call. If you're selling a payroll software, they are going to need to have a presentation or demonstration to make sure it's the right fit for them, right? Because they're not gonna buy an expensive software and commit to completely replacing their old thing with a new thing because it does take a lot of technical work to do. So you're gonna set up for the next step. So if your next step is to do a presentation or demonstration, that would be your next step and you would guide the prospect towards that, right? If your next step is to close them, maybe you're selling something more transactional where it can actually be closed right there and right then, then you would close them, right? But for next steps, typically most people are gonna do next steps. So typically what you would do is after you do your pitch, you would say like, hey, look, you know, based on everything we're talking about so far, is this something that you would actually be interested in? They might say, yeah, this is, the, I think this is what we need. And you would say, okay, well, do you mind if I go ahead and share what the next steps typically would be if you were actually to learn more about our product and see if it's really a fit for you? They're gonna say, sure, Patrick, tell us. You say, well, typically what's gonna happen is, you know, we've done this, this is basically a qualification call, right? For me to learn a little bit more about you to see if you're the right fit for us, right? And then from there, what we would do is based on what you told us and the challenges you had, we will put together a presentation, you know, showing exactly how we're going to solve your problems. Um, you know, if you wanna bring anyone technical on the call, you also can do that to make sure it integrates with everything else in your system. And we're gonna have, you know, an hour presentation where we're gonna go presentation, Q and A. And at the end of that presentation, we're gonna see, you know, whether or not it's a good fit for us to work together. Now, after that presentation, you know, if it still makes sense, we can move on to the next step of, you know, whatever that may be. But for now, I think we should get that presentation done to see if this is something you really want to do before we even talk about what those next steps are. How does that sound to you? They're gonna say, yeah, that sounds fine. Um, let's go ahead and do a presentation. Then you say, okay, great. How about, you know, I got a spot open on my calendar for uh, next week, Tuesday at 2 p.m. How does that sound for you? They'll say, uh, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And you basically schedule it on their calendar after the call. So the important part here is that you're not pushing too hard. You're not selling too hard. You're obviously pitching, but you're only kind of telling them enough from a high level perspective of what they need to know to agree to that next meeting, right? Because it's like your sales process is, you know, step by step by step. 
if you try to do everything on one call, it's too much, right? Because you gotta remember, um, when you're doing cold calling, right? You know, this kind of sales prospecting, the call might be five minutes. So you can't, you know, get through everything in five minutes that will persuade someone to spend $10,000 a year on your software and replace their old thing. You've got to move them to the next step, which is the presentation where you can actually really do the selling. So for the cold call portion of your sales cycle, all you're doing is calling them, building a relationship, identifying the pains, you know, explaining how you might be able to solve those pains and get them interested enough to move to the next step, which is some type of demonstration, some type of meeting where you talk more about how you solve their problems. And so if you keep those five steps in mind, your cold calls are gonna be much better because you have a clear structure of how you actually do your cold calls and you know exactly what to do from start to finish, from the research phase all the way to the next steps to book more meetings or more presentations so that somebody can close more deals. So with that said, that's pretty much my five tips when it comes to cold calling. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Now, if you want to take your sales skills to the next level, make sure to check out my sales course, Sales Legacy, where you're gonna learn everything you need when it comes to starting and accelerating your sales career. So you wanna check out my sales course, make sure to check out the link in the description for free training to learn more. With that said, my name is Patrick Dang, and I'll see you guys in the next one.